All right, everybody, welcome to another exciting video science news. I got three more cool science news uh, stories for you today. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at is about the largest bacteria ever discovered. It's going to be pretty exciting, so let's dig in. Okay, so bacteria are really small, like really, really small. You might think that your own cells are small, but bacterial cells are substantially smaller than even those. In fact, bacterial cells are so small that if you were to take a sample of your own eukaryotic cells and look at them under the microscope, you'd see that they might be coated in a scattering of tiny bacteria. Bacterial cells are usually small because they're significantly simpler than eukaryotic cells. They don't have organelles like a nucleus to house their DNA, or their Golgi apparatus to organize the construction and transport of vesicles and stuff like that. Bacteria don't have endosymbionts like mitochondria or uh, chloroplasts, and many of their cellular processes are performed differently than in eukaryotes. They're more direct and simple, like the bacterial form of gene expression. They don't waste time with all of those exons and introns that eukaryotes muck around with. They just go straight to the gene, express the gene, they use the protein. There you go, that's, that's how it's done. Now the average bacterium is about one to two micrometers in diameter, which is super, super tiny. Uh, but in the case of rod bacteria, which can be a bit larger, they can get up to about 10 micrometers long. These are so small that they can only be seen by a microscope. Well, most of them. Some of the largest species of bacteria can actually reach about 750 micrometers, which is three quarters of a millimeter, and is thus visible to the naked eye. Now, the news that I have for you today is about the Theo Margarita Magnifica, which reportedly grows up to 9,000 micrometers long, which is, uh, that's a bacteria that's about 9 millimeters long, almost a full centimeter in length. It's 50 times as large as the next largest bacterial species, so it's absolutely unprecedented. This bacterium, T. magnifica, was first sampled by, uh, by French marine biologist Olivier Gros about 10 years ago in the Guadalupe Island Cluster in the Lesser Antilles, in the, the northeastern corner of the Caribbean Sea. This is explained a bit in this, uh, this science article on the discovery. <clears throat> All right, where were we? Okay, so he was exploring the northeastern corner of the Caribbean Sea, and uh, uh, Olivier and some of his fellow uh, uh, marine biologists, they found uh, that this bacteria, uh, they saw it feeding on the submerged leaves of Rhizophora mangle, which is a type of tree called the red mangrove, which lives in the area. Now, these leaves were decaying in warm, shallow water, well lit by the sun, and the bacteria grew on it in the form of long, filamentous strands. Now, in images of the organisms, you can see that the basal stalk of the filament is uh, a very long-looking cell. Let me see if I can find something here. Okay, well, here's this video here. Uh, so you can see this, this long structure. This is all a single cell. Um, and then near the tip of the filament here, you can see uh, uh, this filament starts to get pinched. There's like these regular pinch points or budding sites where the cytoplasm is, uh, and the membrane is pinching off to form these smaller cylindrical daughter cells. So let's look at this video really quickly to see the, the movement of these things. Wow, that's pretty incredible. So that's uh, what you saw there were filaments of single individual bacteria. And they're, they're like these long floating strands. And at the end where you see the little pinch points, that's them like budding off little, little spores or something to reproduce. That's really cool. Okay, um, where were we? Okay, so what's pretty interesting here is that at the time of the sampling, um, the researchers didn't actually know that this was a bacterium. It seemed more like a kind of fungus or a slime mold or even a giant algae. But subsequent analyses showed that each filament was actually a single bacterial cell. Now, Jean-Marie Volland was a graduate student of Olivier Gross when she began studying the sample, and she said that uh, they were humongous bacteria. The discovery that they were human... <clears throat> Excuse me. The discovery that they were humongous bacteria was, uh, quote, something that we didn't believe at first. They also called it fantastic and eye-opening, adds Victor Nezet, a physician scientist at the University of California, San Diego, who studies infectious diseases. Really cool stuff. 
Okay, now, the size of this bacteria isn't the only wild thing about it. Remember that bacteria don't have organelles. This is a really important detail. Well, the Theo Margarita Magnifica has not one, but two different types of internal membrane sacs, which operate like organelles. One of the sacs reportedly contains all of the bacteria's genetic material, like a primitive kind of nucleus. And uh, furthermore, the ribosomes, which are protein RNA structures used to express DNA into proteins, they were concentrated within this DNA sac. For regular bacteria, whose DNA is not constrained by any membrane and whose ribosomes are free-floating in the cytoplasm, this too is unprecedented. You can see here in this paragraph, they start to talk about this. Uh, in the article, they say, quote, researchers have long divided life into two groups, prokaryotes, which include bacteria and single-celled microbes called archaea, and eukaryotes, which include everything from yeast to most forms of multicellular life, including humans. Prokaryotes have free-floating DNA, whereas eukaryotes package their DNA in a nucleus. Eukaryotes also compartmentalize various cell functions into vesicles called organelles and can move molecules from one compartment to another, something prokaryotes can't. Now this is where it gets really fascinating. They continue saying, but the newly discovered microbe blurs the line between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And then they go into the story of how uh, it was first discovered about 10 years ago, and then not until five years later did they realize these were actually bacteria, yada yada. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> the other membrane-bound sac, there's, there's two types of sacs in this uh, bacteria. The other type of membrane-bound sac contains mostly water. And that might sound a little underwhelming, but it's actually really important, and it may be key to the bacteria's large size. This membrane water, uh, this membranous sac that contains water, it makes up about 73% of the cell's internal volume, which means that the only living parts of the cell, including the DNA-containing membrane sac, are squished in between the outer, the outer membrane uh, and the cell wall, and this internal water-filled membrane sac. So you have this, this large bacteria organism, but the only parts of it that are actually living are this thin little layer near the surface, because the inside is just water and the outside is obviously outside of its body. Very, very cool stuff. 73% of soil volume. So, uh, okay, yeah, and they say that the similarity in genetic analyses uh, led the researchers to place this Theo Margarita Magnifica uh, in the same genus as most of the other microbial giants, including a, a giant microbe that was found in Namibia. And in the paper, the authors mentioned that the spatial organization of these cellular components may be what allows it to grow so large. I mean, two centimeters for bacteria is enormous. They're, they're referring to the column-like or filamentous shape. If it didn't have this shape, it wouldn't be able to grow this large. Uh, in other words, Volin thinks that these cells can grow larger if they're cultivated in more stable conditions. So not just their raw size, but their potential to grow even larger is also unprecedented. So you can see how there's just layer upon layer of really cool, unprecedented uh, qualities to this new bacteria. Now, if that's not wild enough, uh, understand that the DNA that's contained within this membrane sac includes over 11 million nucleotide bases, with 11,000 identifiable genes. Now compare this to your average bacterium, which has a much more modest genome with about 4 million bases and less than 4,000 genes. The Theo Margarita Magnifica has a colossal genome that, among bacteria, is again unprecedented. But genetic analyses discovered that the bacteria kind of, it kind of cheated to get this massive genome. A huge portion of the genetic material consists of more than 500,000 copies of just a few stretches of DNA. So the genome is huge because much of it is just massively repetitious. The more important detail is that the genome is being stored in its own internal chamber, or membrane sacs, which the authors have called pepins. The presence of these internal membrane-bound sacs is unlike the inner guts of pretty much any other prokaryote. Now, the response in the scientific community to this discovery has been one of amazement and shock. You know, you can read all sorts of articles about this, and in all the ones I've seen, not just this one, um, the scientific community, uh, scientists around the world, um, have been saying, like, uh, they, saying how amazed they are. Um, you know, this bioinformatician, uh, Andrew Steen at the University of Tennessee, said, what an excellent name, talking about how uh, it's referencing the, the, magnific the magnificent uh, uh, or Magnus, the giant size of it. Um, 
Quote, reading about it makes me feel exactly the same way as when I hear about an enormous dinosaur or some celestial structure that is impossibly large or hot or cold or dense or weird in some way, unquote. Other scientists described it as, quote, fantastic and eye-opening, quote, super cool, quote, excellent, quote, pushing what we thought was the upper limit of size by tenfold, and, quote, a missing link in the evolution of complex cells. Fundamentally, the most amazing aspect of this bacteria is its evolved complexity, its prokaryotic attempts to try and uh, achieve some of the internal organization of a typical eukaryote. It is a bacteria. Specifically, it's a sulfur-oxidizing gamma proteobacteria, but it demonstrates a striking series of adaptations of increased internal complexity, you know, such as these internal membranes holding water and DNA, and this kind of compartmentalization was critical in the evolution of eukaryotic cells. And here we see it in a, uh, an example of some prokaryotic cells. Now let's look at the paper here for a second. A centimeter long bacterium with DNA compartmentalized and membrane bound organelles. Very interesting. Yeah, they're just going over the, uh, the data that I summarized earlier. Um, let's look at the end of their paper. Uh, the authors say, quote, <clears throat> Investigating their rare biology, energy metabolism, and the precise role and nature of pepins, of these, uh, these uh, membrane-bound sacs inside the bacteria, will take us a step closer in understanding the evolution of biological complexity. Unquote. This is why this discovery is so amazing. I mean, it's amazing for a lot of reasons, but the really big reason is, uh, is this the organism may be an excellent specimen for research into the evolution of complexity, which would provide priceless insight into one of the biggest mysteries of biological science, understanding the earliest evolutionary stages of pre-eukaryotic and true eukaryotic life. All right. That is a fantastically interesting discovery. Uh, okay, so let's, let's go on to our next story for today. Um, our next story is about a huge ice fish breeding colony that's recently been discovered under the Antarctic ice. All right, so let's get into this. Now, it's easy to think of the polar ice caps as brutal, inhospitable places for life. Whether you're running from polar bears on the floating ice sheets of the, of the North Pole, or you're stumbling in these blinding blizzard conditions on the glaciated continent around the South Pole, there's virtually no life around you. I mean, the polar bears are obviously alive, but they're going to kill you pretty quick and then move on. There's no vegetation within sight uh, of the, I mean, you look out at the horizon, any direction, you're just going to see white, you know, snow, ice, glaciers, maybe a, a dark, frozen sea, but you're not going to see vegetation. If there is any life, it's going to be perhaps fat clusters of penguins waddling around on feces-stained snow, or it's going to be that hungry polar bear chasing you down. And uh, let's not discuss what happens when he, uh, when he sees you. So let's turn our attention to Antarctica, this frozen continent with its glaciated fields and mountains and its skirts of ice shelves over the, the nearby ocean water. Well, despite the landscape being desolate, brutal, and largely inhospitable to life, a new discovery in the Weddell Sea is strong evidence of the fertility of the polar marine habitat. So if you look at a map of Antarctica, so uh, here's a figure that was included in the study, and we can uh, see kind of up close here, um, this sub-figure A, this highlighted area here is the Weddell Sea, and this little black box is uh, uh, the area they were exploring and where they took their measurements and where they, they made this ice fish breeding colony discovery. So if we uh, look at this article here, they say, uh, <clears throat> 500 meters below the ice covering Antarctica's Weddell Sea sits the world's largest known colony of breeding fish, a new study finds. An estimated 60 million active nests of a type of ice fish stretch across at least 240 square kilometers, nearly the size of Orlando, Florida. Many fish create nests, from freshwater chicklids to artistically inclined pufferfish, but until now, researchers have encountered only a handful of ice fish nests at a time, or perhaps several, do uh, several dozen. Even the most gregarious nest-building fish species were previously known to gather only in the hundreds. Now that's uh, some important background information here, because uh, when you start looking at the extent of this ice fish breeding colony here, uh, I went to the, uh, the, the paper published in Current Biology, um, 
you can look at some of these figures. Oh, well, that's not a very good zoom in. Jeez. Uh, but basically, you can see uh, these widespread nests. They're regularly spaced out. They go on for many, many square kilometers. Um, there's uh, approximately one fish you know, hanging out in each nest. Sometimes you got one hanging out close by there. Uh, on average, you know, when you uh, do the math over a geographic area. Um, but this is just a massive, massive uh, uh, nest colony. And they discovered it in part with, you know, putting cameras on seals and stuff like this, which is uh, always pretty fun. The paper's abstract describes, um, or I guess the summary here, uh, describes some of the technical details of the breeding colony. And uh, this stuff is super interesting. So in the paper, they describe directly imaging or recording over 16 thousand individual nests and they use this imagery data to make estimates for the greater trough region as a whole they say quote the colony was estimated to cover at least 240 kilometers of the eastern flank of the filchner trough comprised of fish nests at a density of <clears throat> 0 0.26 nests per square meter representing an estimated total of 60 million active nests and associated fish biomass of approximately uh, or of uh, more than 60,000 tons the majority of nests were each occupied by one adult fish guarding about 1,735 eggs, plus or minus 433, unquote. So some back-of-the-napkin uh, back math suggests that 60 million nests with about 1,700 eggs is a bit over 100 billion eggs. Naturally, not all of these are going to live to adulthood, but it's still a colossal population reserve for these ice fish. For comparison, the largest ice fish colonies that were discovered before this one were all fewer than 100 individual nests. So to suddenly find an estimated 60 million nests is just, it's insane. Like, that's crazy. Now in the paper, they also note the impressively consistent density of the nests. For hundreds of meters of habitat, even in the most heavily populated areas, the nests are consistently placed about 25 centimeters apart. No nests were observed in physical contact with each other and the nests were uniformly sized, they were all bowl-shaped, and they had a consistent uh, use of materials in their construction. They were composed of the same stuff. It was arranged and organized in the same way, such as the placement of rocks, pebbles, and coarse and fine-grained sediments. Furthermore, the colony had a uniform nest density right up to the edges, so it didn't, like, taper off or anything. It didn't get more spaced out near the edges. Uh, the nests continued at the same regular spacing until they more or less stopped suddenly at the, the edge of the colony. The authors continued the abstract, saying, quote, Bottom water temperatures measured across the nesting colony were up 2 degrees C warmer than surrounding bottom waters, including a spatial correlation between the modified warm deep water upflow into the Weddell Sea shelf and the active nesting area. Uh, so this basically means that the breeding colony is strategically, geographically posi positioned in the course of a warm water current. And that's really nice for the eggs. Uh, th this, this is a region of the trough where, warm, where the warm water current is the warmest and it carries the most nutrients. Continuing with the abstract, the authors say, quote, Historical and concurrently collected seal, movements, uh, seal movement data indicate that this concentrated fish biomass may be utilized by predators such as Weddell seals, uh, Leoptonychotes wedellii, uh, Leptonychotes wedellii, scientific names are always fun. Uh, continuing, numerous degraded fish carcasses within and near the nesting colony suggest that in death as well as life, these fish provide input for local food webs and influence local biogeochemical processing. To our knowledge, the area surveyed harbors the most spatially expansive continuous fish breeding colony discovered to date, globally, at any depth, as well as an exceptionally high Antarctic seafloor biomass." Unquote. So they expand on these points in the paper about um, the fish participating in the food web by uh, acting as prey for so many other species. Uh, or as biomass to be scavenged by other species. Um, they expand on this point in their paper, uh, mentioning that large, you know, greater than 15 centimeter in diameter sea spiders that prowl at the uh, edges of the colony will seek unguarded eggs and weak newborn juveniles to snatch and gobble up. Some braver predators, like uh, species of skates, have they were also seen sneaking into the nests, even right beneath the guardian ice fish, to eat the eggs and, of course, those weak juveniles. 
Now, away from the guarded areas, uh, particularly where the currents carried freshly dead bodies of the ice fish, there were loiter, uh, loiter, loitering populations of, quote, ophiroids, starfish, octopi, and various fish species, unquote. They were all opportunistically feeding on the dead ice fish biomass. Older corpses were eventually... <clears throat> Older corpses were dissolved by carpets of uh, hungry bacteria. Now, in abandoned or empty nests, occasional colonies of sponges and anemones would take over. After all, the nests are really valuable real estate. In this part of the ocean, in this Filchner's trough in the Weddell Sea area, there's no coral reefs or big rocks or anything, uh, anything that um, could serve as a catch-all for debris and detritus in the current. Only the nests that have been built by these ice fish, uh, only, only the nests do that here. The, nests are, uh, the nest structures are basically effective traps for dead plant matter uh, deposited by the current, uh, as well as other kinds of uh, detritus and marine snow. And uh, this debris can feed the ice fish and the larva, as well as all these other herbivores or filter feeders that are also hanging out in the area. Now, in the conclusion section of the paper, the authors, uh, they write, quote, Sediment engineering during nest formation has likely influenced benthic biogeochemical processes by redistributing sediments and providing hydrodynamic traps for the localized increased accumulation of settling organic matter and dead fish, unquote. And lastly, the authors argue that the scale and the obvious significance of the breeding colony requires protection. They say, quote, we believe our discovery provides support for endeavors to protect the Weddell Sea from anthropogenic impacts by establishing a regional marine protected area under the Southern Ocean under the Convention on the Conservation of Arctic Marine Living Resources, uh, that umbrella, unquote. Well, damn, there it is. This is some awesome science news. A massive ice fish breeding colony of unprecedented scale has been discovered under the Antarctic sea ice, and it serves as a hotspot of biomass production that feeds all manner of creatures, from echinoderms, cephalopods, and teniforms, uh, tenophores to marine mammals. It really is an amazing discovery, and I certainly hope that it gets the protections that the authors are advocating for, so it can continue to be an ecological pillar for this region of the Weddell Sea and of the Southern Ocean generally, indefinitely, into the future. Okay, that was exciting. So let's go to our final science news story of the day, uh, a new discovery of a fairy wrasse. Uh, uh, it's a first ever fish discovery by a Maldivian scientist, so it's cool for two reasons. Uh, we'll get into that. I love good news stories about coral reefs and news stories about discovering new animals. Even better is when a new species of animal is discovered in a healthy coral reef. And that's exactly the science news story that I have for you right now. So back in 1995, a marine biologist sampling animals around the Maldives off the uh, southern tip of India, they identified what they thought was an adult specimen of the fish Sirhalibris rubrisquamis, or the, the rosy scales fairy wrasse. Now this is a really colorful little reef fish that's native to this part of the world, but uh, new research came to the surprising realization that this is actually not an adult uh, rosy scales fairy wrasse, but it's an entirely new species. The name for this new species is the Sirhalibris finifenmaa, or the rose-veiled fairy wrasse. The scientific species name, uh, finifenmaa, means rose in the local Devehi language, and that's pretty fitting, as the color of the Maldives' national flower is a nice match to some of the pinks on the fish. Now, this work has been described in a recent paper published in the journal uh, Zoo Keys, and if you go through the paper, uh, we can, uh, I'll come back to the abstract in a second, but if you go through the paper, um, <clears throat> you can see all the morphological and physiological details that they compare between specimens to make their determination. You know, like right here we have uh, dorsal fin, base, pre-pelvic length, longest dorsal spine, longest dorsal ray, anal fin base, uh, first anal spine, that kind of thing. All these different morphological features that they compare. Um, and they have uh, uh, pictures of the original specimen. Um, this is the Ruber squamous that uh, it was originally misidentified as. Uh, and then here you have the actual pictures of the um, of this new species of fairy wrasse itself. Uh, and you can see it's got these really beautiful reds and golds and, uh, and pinks. So they looked at the coloration and the striping or the spotting patterns, the number and the size of fin spines, and the number of scales on certain body regions. 
uh, University of Sydney doctoral student Yi Kai T was the lead author of the, uh, lead author of the paper. Uh, T said, quote, um, what we previously thought was one widespread species of fish is actually two different species, each with a potentially much more restricted distribution. This exemplifies why describing new species and taxonomy in general is important for conservation and biodiversity management. So in other words, when they realized that this one species was actually two distinct species, they also realized that each species has a much smaller range than originally thought. And this is important information to take into consideration when, for, uh, for example, you're listing them as endangered or not. Uh, unfortunately, this might be relevant sooner rather than later. Apparently, this fish, even though it's new to science, is already being trafficked and commercialized for things like aquariums and uh, uh, collectors. Senior author of the paper, Louise Rocha, said, quote, uh, Though the species... Oh, come on said, quote, though the species is quite abundant and therefore not currently at high risk of overexploitation, it's still unsettling when a fish is already being commercialized before it even has a scientific name. It speaks to how much biodiversity there is still left to be described from coral reef ecosystems. Now, on a more positive note, this species is the first species to be described by an ethnically Maldivian researcher. Second, on, uh, second author on the paper, Ahmed Najib, said, quote, it has always been foreign scientists who have described species found in the Maldives without much involvement from local scientists, even those that are endemic to the Maldives. This time, it is different, and getting to be part of something for the first time has been really exciting, especially having the opportunity to work alongside top ichthyologists on such an elegant and beautiful species." Unquote. Now there's even more good news. These coral reefs near the Maldives are relatively unexplored, and there's tons of new species here that are just waiting to be discovered. There are also deep water reefs, existing at depths between 50 and 150 meters, which makes them even more exotic and mysterious. The reefs have been the focus of ongoing research programs uh, between groups like Hope for Reefs and the Maldives Marine Research Institute. And they report that, in addition to this uh, Sir Halibris finifenma'a, they also sampled from that region about eight more species that are also new to science. Now, about this partnership with, uh, or between Hope for Reefs and the MMRI, Ahmed Najib said, quote, uh, Collaborating with organizations such as the Academy helps us build our local capacity to expand knowledge in this field. This is just the start, and we are, all, <clears throat> and we are already working together on future projects. Our partnership will help us better understand the unexplored depths of our marine ecosystem and their inhabitants. The more we understand and the, <clears throat> the more... Uh, the more we understand and the more compelling scientific evidence we gather, the better we can protect them." Unquote. All right, well, there you go. Three science news stories about new organisms being discovered uh, with a lot of good news layered on top of there as well. Um, yeah, super awesome stuff.